Welcome to the Vintage Hollywood Archive. Hard times don't last, but only the tough survive the period. This reminds me of the boisterous personality of the ruggedly built gentleman. His name is Rod Taylor. He is, at a glance, handsome and classy and never fails to remind his American audience through his antics that he is from a different cultural background, a true son of Australian soil. He became famous for fighting and winning imaginary wars as one of the classic Hollywood leading men of his era. Amidst the tough Hollywood competitive arena, he won fame discreetly playing his roles his way. Make sure to watch the video until the end, and if you're new here, don't forget to join the wonderful community by subscribing to the Vintage Hollywood Archive channel. Rod Taylor was one of my favorite actors. He appeared tough, acted rough, and got himself a screen identity as a rough character, but he was a true gentleman that just has a way of running his shows. Many believed that he squared one-on-one -on -one with classic American actors of his era and was never intimidated and rather was proud of his Australian heritage. Unlike his counterparts like Errol Flynn, an Australian who was projected by Hollywood Studios as a British character for acceptability. It takes an audience that enjoys individual resourcefulness to appreciate and understand Robert Taylor's slightly bashful screen persona as an actor who shined in tough guy roles but with a soft personality. Hollywood's famous director, Alfred Hitchcock, got things right when he put him on the set for The Birds in 1963. He became the proverbial goldfish with no hiding place as Walt Disney came knocking on his door so he could voice a Dalmatian. I also heard that Albert Cubby Broccoli had wanted Robert Taylor to be the famous James Bond, but he, unfortunately, declined. He thought the story would not make a good movie and turned that one down because he erroneously said it was best for television, though he regretted it later and described his comment about the movie as very stupid. Some believe Rod Taylor would have gotten things better with more pay and stardom if only he'd been able to put the comedy side of his talent to action alongside his handsome and sporty build. But that did not seem to be the case as he was more flexible with those of his heroic action movies. As seen in a few of his comedy outings, Taylor did not reflect the flair for the light comedy, having been typecasted with the insensitive and macho mannerisms that made him famous among lovers of the war genre. Rod Taylor may have done his best as a movie talent to some extent, but critics still believe he could have done better to place himself where they thought he deserved on the superstar ladder. A man that co-starred with Doris Day, Jane Fonda, Rock Hudson, and John Wayne, and had leading roles in notable classic films including the recurrently popular science fiction The Time Machine in 1960. It was a career-defining moment for Rod Taylor, when at the climax of his career he got a no from 20th Century Fox for a part as the astronaut in Planet of the Apes. The studio considered Charlton Heston a bigger box office character. That notwithstanding, Rod Taylor remained a wonderful performer any day. Not with what did end the 1936 Liz and Dick soap opera, The VIP's Doll, that film is a must-watch for anyone who wants to know more about Taylor's talent. I loved the movie so much that I kept watching it over and over. That movie has the people I call the who's who in the entertainment scene at the time, including the double Taylors, Rod and Elizabeth. From the marital circumstances of the main character, who are both real and movie couple Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, as put together by creative Orson Welles, the audience is pushed to the edge of their seats as they try to catch the trills. Remarkably and very outstanding was a man portrayed as an entrepreneur, Rod Taylor with his ever-loving secretary portrayed by Maggie Smith, who was eager and willing to confess the burning affection. Rod Taylor, an Australian-born talent whose parents were average working class, started art classes in high school, and after graduating from college, decided he would be better as a career actor. Probably inspired by Lawrence Oliver after watching an old Vic touring production of Richard III. He started appearing in several local theater productions for Australia's Mercury Theater. Born in 1930, Taylor was a pupil of the Parramatta High School and acquired further knowledge at the East Sydney Technical and Fine Arts College, where he took his art classes. His mother desired that his son become an artist of a sort, knowing the value of creative talent and being a creative author of children's books herself. She mounted pressure on Taylor to concentrate on his art lessons, but the young man had his flair. 
After working briefly as a commercial artist at the time, and making ends meet as a staff of Sydney's Mark Foy's department store, where he designed and painted windows and other displays, his interest shifted. On how he felt working as an artist, Taylor said he was painting pottery and listening to a particularly interesting radio serial and was telling himself, you know, I can do that, before deciding to follow his passion. And that was how performing arts won his attention. He began with radio and from that made his way to the movies. Taylor had enough radio and stage acting experience in Australia. Notable among his radio production was a period on Blue Hills and a part as Tarzan. He was part of the 1951 reenactment of Charles Sturt's voyage down the Murrumbidgee and Murray Rivers, playing Sturt's offsider, George McLean. His first feature film was also in the Australian Lee Robinson film, King of the Coral Sea, in which he appeared as Rodney Taylor, depicting an American because he was showing good American accents. He soon showed up in a Hollywood-financed movie filmed in Sydney, Long John Silver that same year before being recognized with the 1954 Rolla Show Australian Radio Actor of the Year Award, which booked a ticket for him to London through Los Angeles. Unlike most Australian actors who would move their career to England as the common practice then, Taylor's interest was in Hollywood. So, somehow he chooses to party in the American movie scene. He was quite consistent and focused all through his career. Though certain circumstances did not favor him, he never gave up on what he believed. He also had a very quiet family life, though not without the usual celebrity marital trouble. He was first married to a model, Peggy Williams, in 1951. It seemed things did not pan out right for the couple as they ditched their matrimony three years after an issue of domestic violence came up between them, and that one ended in a divorce. Taylor later told fans that the marriage needed to end because he and his wife thought they were too young to maintain healthy matrimony. He was once in a passionate, romantic relationship with Swedish actress Anita Ekberg sometime in the 1960s and was reported to have engaged her, but it suddenly ended between them within a short time. He also tried his romantic passion for Pat Sheehan before deciding to settle the second time in marriage with Mary Hylam. The duo had a daughter, Felicia Taylor. When the marriage ended, Taylor was still active and romantically vulnerable, so he got connected for the third time with Carol Kikamura. The marriage took place in 1980, even though the union looked more like their second coming since they had dated earlier in the 1960s when the young lady was doing a stint in the TV series Hong Kong. They got reunited in 1971 and took time to study each other for about nine years before joining themselves in matrimony. Robert Taylor was prepared and ready to hit it big in Hollywood, but was never in a hurry for anything as the true gentleman he is. This is true considering some of the circumstances that defined his years both in MGM and other studios. When in 1956, Taylor auditioned for the role of the boxer Rocky Graziano in MGM Somebody Up There Likes Me, following the death of the rebel without a cause, prodigy James Dean, who was initially billed to feature in the movie. Taylor took things easy and handled his issues the way they came. Even though Paul Newman rather took the role, Taylor was remarkable that the studio decided to use him in another production that they thought was suitable to his image. His show in The Catered Affair, also referred to as The Wedding Breakfast, will suffice. Fans saw Taylor intermittently put on glasses as a sign of brain power, appearing as Ralph, the conformist fiancé of lower-class Jane, depicted by Debbie Reynolds. Taylor later spoke about his audition and how his Brooklyn intonation earned him that role. The Brooklyn accent I put on during the test so convinced the producers that I was from New York, he said. That was how the studio got convinced that this Australian talent had came to the U.S. less than two years ago, was a Bronx boy. They cast him in the role and significantly did not know that he was never an American until the movie was almost finished. Taylor's handsomeness and tough physique, plus his fresh language strength, was working to his advantage as he got more work, including a brief one in Giant, where the two Taylors appeared. This time, his character was Elizabeth Taylor's noble English suitor, whom she dixed for the Texas millionaire portrayed by Rock Hudson. It was quite interesting that this Australian talent was taking English-speaking jobs from his American colleagues. It seems the studio found a working formula in the two Taylors because they played again in 1957, Rain Tree Country. From then till Rod grew to the status of Hollywood leading man, he had never hidden his Australian heritage or character and regularly depicted an Australian on screen. 
with the movie, the High Commissioner, and the VIPs, according to Stefan Welnick and Robert D. Young, who are both producers and directors of the movies. Rob may have led the way for the eventual portrayal of Australian masculinity on the Hollywood screen, as direct no-nonsense and rugged that continued till the present times. Taylor, who had no idea initially of becoming an actor, said he had always loved acting, but felt he didn't fit to be an actor. While he was pursuing his creative art vocation some years back, Taylor got connected with extreme physical activities, though he never knew he was preparing himself for a destined acting career. He said he became the leader of the surfing club that is deeply involved in a fitness lifestyle. Did they say they would do as a high as 500 push-ups a day? Perhaps as part of the routine fitness. About his breakthrough movie, Rod once recalled with pleasure the time machine and the director George Powell, a man he described as the dearest little goblin that he has seen in life. Of course, the time machine and the subsequent movie made Rod Taylor a star to watch in Hollywood. Very ambitious Taylor did not hesitate to join American television shows when he got an offer to be part of the Studio 57 production. He became the main character of the show, Hong Kong, and showing as a tough foreign correspondent his career remains a subject for another day because there is no way of knowing the things he missed while doing the show. But soon after that, his never-ending energy got him the star-studded movie, The VIPs, and for the 101 Dalmatians, it seems Taylor did not enjoy that role. He expressed reservations about it because the moment they called him up for the voicing, he said he was immensely disappointed. Perhaps he was cheap and could do an English accent that was why they called him up for it, and he ended up, according to him, being famous among kids. I was more famous with kids than anybody because I played the English doggy, he was quoted. After scanning Rod Taylor's filmography, one can't help but agree that he had rare quality, a versatile talent apart from his handsome outlook. He could play the intellectual role, bad-tempered, and even a likable bad guy. If you placed him as a killer, you'd still get his best performance. He did a lot of career dynamism that would have gotten him even better standing in Hollywood. Sometimes said Taylor was an adventurous man. He was also a romancer, a man of action indeed. Is it true that a star is not always recognized? Those who worked with Taylor said they loved to work with him in movies because he adds more flavor on set with his presence. Apart from appearing in several feature films, Ron did excellently in his television series and was highly respected for his artistry in the field of creative art. He did his best to openly portray an Australian, unlike his predecessors who inclined themselves towards being more British than their Australian descendant. Almost everyone, including Stephen Welling, who recently recognized the effort of Rob Taylor in the industry, thinks that his work was underappreciated and needed to be kept alive even though he is no more. His legacy would not be easily forgotten. Rod was a wonderful narrator and aided in productions with the desired light and shade for effective narrative. While he never made demands about style or content, he was more conscious of appearing in a movie that is entertaining and reflected his style in life in his career that spanned about 50 years. Ron Taylor decided to go into semi-retirement at some point in his career in the late 1980s and was confronted by reporters who wanted to know why. He told them that pretending to still be the tough man of acting isn't dignified for him anymore. There comes a time when you're over the hill and there are plenty of great-looking young actors who he believed were capable of occupying his place. The younger they come, the better they get. That's why Olympic records are broken, he was quoted. Fan woke up on the 7th of January, 2015, to hear that their screen hero Rod Taylor left humanity to eternity after suffering from a heart attack. The incident, which occurred at his Beverly Hills home, was heartily felt by his wife, Carol, and daughter, who surrounded him at the last hours, just four days before he turned 85. Rod Taylor will always embody masculinity for us, but it is also very interesting. Why was Janice Page considered the hard-to-get girl? Let's find out from this video.